everyone. I am Pavlos Protopapas. I am the scientific uh, program director for the Institute for Applied Computational Science. Uh, and I'm here to introduce our speaker. But before I do that, just a small announcement. Next week, we have uh, Bob Rogers from Intel, who will be talking about artificial or augmented AI. That's next Friday here. Uh, no. <laughs> Where is it? B01 3? Yeah, you get a geological museum across the street 100, sorry. Uh, so it is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Uh, a typical thing I will say, Finale doesn't need introduction, but I will do the introduction. Uh, she is uh, an assistant professor here at CIS. Most of you have seen her, took courses with her, or work with her. Uh, before joining CIS, she was a postdoc at the uh, Center for Biomedical Informatics at Harvard Medical School. She received her PhD at MIT, and she had, a, before that, a master's at University of Cambridge as a Marshall Scholar. Uh, her research described in, the web, in her website is about um, learning, um, is, uh, design robust models to combine complex data with other knowledge, a few other things. But I will summarize it that she works in every topic of machine learning. I've seen a lot of papers but for her, and they cover a lot of aspects. Um, one thing I want to mention, though, is that she's not just a great researcher, but she's a great mentor and teacher. I don't think I've seen a student that came by my office who, hasn't, who wants to work in machine learning. He doesn't want to work, or she doesn't want to work with Finale. I think if she could clone Finale, we could have many more students working for her, or her clones. Uh, fortunately, there's only one of them. Uh, and also, the students that work for her, they are also so satisfied, so happy working for her. So I think that's an aspect that is not in your website. I wanted to mention it. Uh, and please uh, help me to welcome Finale. Thank you. It's uh, great to see such a huge crowd and lots of familiar faces from lots of courses in the, in the lab. So today I'm going to be talking about interpretable machine learning as applied to the ICU. And I'll talk about some modeling stuff that we're doing in my lab, but also raise some questions about how we approach machine learning and AI more generally in situations like healthcare, which are very tricky. So let's get started. Um, I just want to first lay the, uh, lay the bit of a groundwork for where we are in healthcare. So there's, um, there's, there's people who are working on uh, uh, things at the point of care or personalized medicine. And that's mostly what my lab works on, where we're trying to assign patient, uh, patients and treatments together. Let me just grab a real pointer. Um, <laughs> rather, than, <laughs> rather than this thing, which is really hard to see. All right, so, so there's work on assigning treatments to patients. Um, and then there's also work um, more on the policy side, which is really, really important. Because if you, if you look at the statistics, the United States is winning the um, we're paying a lot of money for a healthcare game, um, and we're also winning the our outcomes are worse game. Um, and this is not ideal, right? Um, so this is the sort of thing where research and policy need to come together to make a difference. And just to give you a bit of a flavor, in my lab, uh, I'm going to be talking today about work that we're doing in the ICU. But there's other stuff that we're also doing, um, great work. Um, by Michael Hughes, my postdoc, who's in the audience, on depression treatment optimization. Um, awesome stuff that we're doing with subtyping autism, um, also with another postdoc, Mari, who's in the audience, um, and uh, doing work with HIV treatment optimization. So these are all lots of different questions, and they all have the similar feature of trying to understand temporal trajectories of patients and figure out what treatments are best for them. So in the ICU, uh, I'm going to start this story a couple years back, where I first started working with ICU data. Uh, and so here we have uh, our, our patients. They're in really bad shape, right? People in the ICU are very, very sick. Um, and a natural question that people might ask is, are these people going to make it? Well, we have a lot of information in the ICU. You can see there is a patient somewhere, right, <laughs> hidden under everything. Um, but there are just tons and tons of monitors that these patients are hooked up to. Um, and so in terms of places where machine learning is really starting to 
um, be accepted in the medical sphere, the ICU is one of them because the doctors are inundated with data. And we went to, um, we went to rounds with some of the ICU doctors um, a couple months ago, and you know, they, they were spending like maybe two or three minutes looking at the patient, and then like outside the room, they would have this huddle for maybe 20 or 30 minutes just looking at all the data from all the different sources as they tried to come to a decision about what was the right thing to do as they were rounding. There's a ton of information that's being collected on these monitors, and the doctors know that they can't handle it all. And so that's why the ICU makes a, a great test bed because not only um, can we hope that there's stuff to do because there's lots of data, but these clinicians are actually really interested in the outputs of our work. The other reason why they're very interested is that they're often, you know, flying by the seat of their pants, they, they have a patient who's very sick and the question is like, is there anything that they can do? So in this work, what we did is we took all of this data and we put it into a bunch of features. So these are all uh, what we're gonna call structured features. So structured data because we know what monitor it comes from, we know it's a blood pressure, we know it's a pulse ox, et cetera. And then we added to this all the things that were being written down in the clinician's notes, right? So they, they actually they put it on a computer, not on paper, thankfully, these days, so we can run NLP extraction algorithms on it. We can get a bunch of keywords, but we still considered it unstructured because initially it was just a bunch of free text that was created by the clinicians, and now we have to put it together to try to figure out what's going on. So we have this, and I'm not gonna go into details in terms of like how we convert it into a number, um, but many of you, because you've taken my courses, um, <laughs> know what a topic model is. And a topic model is basically just a way to extract out what are the major patterns in a bunch of text data. So in this case, um, if the doctor is talking a lot about renal stuff and kidney function, that might become a theme or a topic. Um, if the doctor is talking a lot about respiration, that might become another topic. So you'll get a bunch of these topics. Think of this, if you don't know topic models, as a way to convert all the words that are being written down um, into, now you have raw counts of words into some sort of vector representation. And there's nothing special about topic models. You could have used something fancier like word to vec and other things like that to try to create a representation. Um, this was several years ago, so this seemed like a simple out of the box thing to be able to try. So we take these two pieces of information, basically the numerical information that's coming off of the monitors, um, augment it with things that the clinician is noticing, because, and that's important because the clinician is noticing things that are not being recorded on the monitors and vice versa. Uh, and then we pass it through something fairly simple, just an SVM. Right? So what happens if we do that? So we see the following. So here we're trying to make predictions about mortality. Um, given the length of stay, which is the amount of data we have about them. And what you'll see is that if you just use information about when they came in and nothing else, then as, you, as the length of stay increases, you're not gathering any more information and your predictions get steadily worse. Right? So that doesn't do so great. Um, if you have a, a model that um, just uses the textual data, that's the red model. Um, as it gathers more text, it starts doing better, and if you start using the text and the numbers together and all the information, um, you do pretty well and you stay pretty steady. Um, there's a small decrease here, um, and because I wanna focus on the real sorts of issues that come up, um, the, the small decrease is coming up because there's just not a lot of data. Like, not many people are in the ICU this long, right? So your prediction quality goes down. Um, and importantly, all of these are worse than if you kind of had the oracle that could look backwards in time and say like from at the end of the visit, if you looked at all of their data, how well could you make predictions? That's a less interesting problem, but a problem at least at that time people were really interested in solving because it was easy to cast as a machine learning problem, but not very useful for clinicians um, because by the end of the stay, you already know whether or not they've survived the in-hospital stay, right? Um, but anyway, this gives you an upper bound on how well you might be able to do on this task, right? So we, we were doing pretty well, um, not bad. Uh, but there was a big problem with this, and one of the things that we are moving more and more towards in my lab now is that even if you have someone who's really sick, right, you still have to treat them. So the question of what, do, like, you know, what's, what's the probability of mortality 
is only somewhat useful, right? If you have a patient that's very unlikely to make it, there are implications, right, where you might want to reach out to the family, and you might want to have certain end-of-life discussions, um, but at the same time, oftentimes the question is, what do we do, right? Like, okay, maybe this person only has a 10% chance of survival now, but what is, is there anything that we can do at this moment that will increase those odds or at least not decrease them, right? So we want to move from things that are actually actionable, uh, or move towards things that are actually actionable. So that's what we are, now, now I'm going to uh, describe some projects we, that we worked on. Um, where instead of going for mortality, we want to predict interventions and also wean readiness. So let me describe those two problems to you. So the first one is more of a logistics sort of thing. So if we know that someone is likely to need, especially a serious intervention, like if they're going to need to be intubated, um, the, you know, hospitals these days, at least here, you know, they have lots of ventilators and such. You're not going to be out of one, but it's still good to be able to prepare, right? And to know that this patient is okay right now, but the chances are, like, in the near future, we're going to need to get this person on a ventilator. So it's useful from a hospital logistics perspective. Um, and secondly, it can also be useful for the patient, because there, some of these interventions require the patient be sedated, which means that once you're on the intervention, you lose your ability to communicate your wishes and your decisions. So if you know that chances are in the next six hours, you're conscious now, um, but you're going to need to be intubated, again, that's a point where perhaps a, a clinician can initiate any conversations that need to be initiated before that, before that happens, right? So that's, that's why it might be useful to predict an intervention. Um, and then the second piece of this, um, wean readiness. So this is when are you ready to come off an intervention? And here the question is, if you stay on an intervention for too long, um, there's implications. Like, uh, none of these are good for you. Um, none of these interventions are good for you. Uh, so there's long-term consequences to yourself from being on them for a long time. Um, but at the same time, if you take someone off an intervention too early, that can also have very drastic negative consequences. All right, so you want to try to get this, uh, you want to be conservative, but you also want to get it right. So here's a sense of the data we use. So in this case, we only use data, uh, the, the, the numerical data. We didn't use the, the notes. And we have data that are physiological time series. And for now, I'm going to talk about one particular inter intervention, vasopressors. And we have predictions that we're trying to make. So here, the vasopressor was administered at this time. And we want to know at any t sort of time window, you know, are they going to need a vasopressor soon, right? So that's the imminent need task. Will they need one in the near future? And also, once they're on the vasopressor, when are they going to be ready to come off, right? So that's the third question, the wean readiness question. So to do this, um, again, I'm going to give you a very, very high level of our modeling approach. And we can talk math at any other point. Um, so here. We have some outcome that we're trying to model. We modeled this as a switching state dynamical system. So there's some hidden state that the patient is in. And we assume that this hidden state and everything observed about them, so all of these numerics over here are, are transitioning over time. And some hidden state tells us what sort of transitions are going on. So the first thing we do is just try to learn a model of like how those histories look like, that picture that I showed you a couple of slides ago. Um, once we have that, we can do inference for any particular patient about what, uh, what state they were in. And then we can use all of the information about what we see and also um, what the patient's state might be to make a prediction uh, of our choice. Right? So, Inference, again, is relatively straightforward for this. I'm not going to go into it. Uh, fairly simple model, but ends up mo capturing a key notion that we think that patients are in different dynamical states, right? That they're patients who are in some sort of stable dynamics. Um, maybe there's patients who are in less stable dynamics. And the different unstable dynamics or, or bad dynamics have different characteristic forms, right? That's the hypothesis in any case. So if we do this, um, we, we can do. Um, we can do pretty well. So here are a bunch of different approaches. And you can see that in terms of short-term pr prediction, we're, we can do extremely well. 
in terms of being able to predict that someone's going to need a vasopressor. And if we look at slightly longer term prediction, we can do that also pretty well. Right? So from a, again, a hospital logistics perspective, um, you know, when does this person need to get set up? You know, is this person likely to need to get set up? And these people have so much attached to them, right? You saw that first picture. And, and when we rounded with folks, you know, you just saw, like, just, you know, there's like 50 bags of, but not 50, like 10, though. <laughs> 10 or 15 bags of different things that, that patients are getting. Um, and so these things take time to set up. Um, the nurse I was following took nearly an hour just to check every single one of those um, drips and, and all of those things. So it, it's, a, it's a useful thing to kind of know. And each one needs to be, you need to monitor how much fluid is left, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so we can do pretty well with that. Cool. So then the next question, right, was the, uh, the question of weaning. Like, when is a patient ready to come off of an intervention? So here I'm just going to give, uh, first I'm going to give you the qualitative story. So here we have on the bottom axis some hours. And on this part over here, this is our probability that we think the wean is going to be successful, right? So it's a log probability. So when we hit zero, that means that we're pretty sure that you could take this person off the vasopressor. And it's really hard to know whether or not you're doing a good job, right? Because most of the time, people do not get put back uh, on the vasopressor. Like, it, people don't screw up that often in this data set, where you take someone off of it, and then like all of a sudden, you need to put them back on. And we defined, in particular, that if they had to go back on within a four-hour period, that was a screw up. But if it was more than that, then maybe what happened is that you, know, you legitimately thought they were ready, and then something else happened to their situation and caused you to need to be back on a vasopressor again. So if we look at that, there's very few, uh, very few screw ups. But what we did is when we trained this is we looked at the beginnings and the ends. Right? So let's suppose if there's very few screw ups, the patient is going to be in some state toward the end, like when they're actually weaned. Um, and then there's going to be uh, how they look at the very beginning, when they first go on the vasopressor. Right? And they, those should look different. Because when they first go on the vasopressor, Clearly, they're not ready to be weaned right away. You just put them on. Um, and then when you look at them look at them at the very end, when you took them off, um, they, they probably are ready, right? Uh, you, you check to make sure there was no screw up at the end. And so if you train on just those two pieces, the early and the later part, now you can look at the middle. And you can start to make a guess of like, when do patients start looking more like the end versus more like the beginning? And so if we do that, um, you know, we get curves that look like this. That makes sense because like, at, at some point, you know, they were definitely not ready. And then the curves go up. And if, you, um, if we look at the, the notes that are written, the clinic notes, um, we see that you know, various bad things were going on over here, um, suggesting that the patient was not ready. Um, when we still thought they weren't quite ready, there was a question of like attempt that didn't actually work um, in terms of weaning them. Uh, so this was a case where it did actually fail. Um, and then later on, um, they say that the, the, the wean was successful. And again, it, this, is a, this is just a sanity check in this sort of thing. It's always important to just check the, with the data, because you can't really tell for sure. Um, this is another example um, where we uh, start out with a prediction, and then you know, we say that the person is probably ready to come off. And what's really interesting about this case is that in the numerical notes, like the structured fields, they actually forgot to write down that the person had been weaned. So our classifier saw that the patient went on the vasopressor at this time. And then it thought that the person would continue to be on a vasopressor forever. And so it was making predictions about when the person was ready to come off. And at first, we thought this was a problem, right? Where we were like, oh, it, it predicted way too early. Like, this patient was on the, you know, for many, many more hours like, till the end of the visit. And then when we looked at the notes, we saw that, oh, the patient was actually weaned about the time that we said the patient was ready to be weaned, which was, um, but, but it was a, a, you know, notice that we were making the prediction like, before they actually said the wean happened. We didn't just detect the fact that they were weaned. <laughs> um, but, 
uh, that was that was kind of a, a nice test case to show that oh, okay we we seem to be doing a reasonable job of making these predictions. So if we do this uh, now and we look at it quantitatively, um, we have various AUCs in our in our predictions, which are again decent, but take with a grain of salt because there's not that many screw ups, right? So it's not not very many op opportunities to show that oh we were better um, than the than the clinician. Um, but the other piece that we can look at is a potentially unnecessary time. So how early do we say that the person is ready to go um, compared to when they actually came off? Uh, so what we find is that some of these might be bad data, as I mentioned. You know, maybe people just forgot to note down that the person was actually weaned. Um, and that's something that we haven't been able to go through and check in detail for every single case. Uh, but there are a lot of cases um, where it seems like, I mean, all of these certainly can't be bad data, that people in general are being kept on these pressors for a longer time than perhaps is necessary, right? And when you talk to folks in the ICU, yes, they're being very conservative, um, but they also are very quick to point out that um, being on a vasopressor, again, has various negative things that, that cause, you know, that happen to you when you're, when you're on a vasopressor. And so if we could reduce that time, that's potentially better for patients. Um, and if that can reduce stays overall, then that's even, that's even better, right? So there's validation to be done, but this suggests that, um, you know, maybe there, there's optimization here, both for the patients and the healthcare system. Because if you can move along with the patients, they're ready for the next stage of their treatment, you're keeping them less time overall in the hospital. All right, so we did the same thing um, for a bunch of other interventions as well, and this one I'm gonna go through relatively quickly. Um, we use uh, the same dynamical system to make predictions about all of these. So going back to that first picture, remember once you learn how the patient's dynamics evolve over time, you can go through and collect which state you think they were in. And now you can learn a separate classifier from all, all the things you've observed and the patient's state to the outcome of interest, right? So same process that we did before, but now with multiple different interventions. And we find that in general, if the orange ones are the ones where we incorporate this, this dynamical information, over here is like predicting an imminent need, and then this and this further back in time. So the predictions become harder as you go down, and these are for different interventions. Um, and in general, it helps a bit, right, to include some of that dynamical information. So again, this can be useful for now predicting a series of intervention needs rather than just the vast suppressors. All right. So now I want to turn to a, a more pertinent question. As I said, I'm going to spend, I wanted to introduce you all to some of the questions we're working on, and I'll return a bit more to some research that we're doing. But I want to start out, I, I want to raise an important question that comes up when you're solving these sorts of problems. So the question is, let's just return to actually the, uh, the mortality prediction case, right? A natural question actually following this would be like, does the clinical note help even more, right? Like, can you, can you push this like you did the other one? But before we go there, or, you know, the reason why we, we haven't gone there quite yet, is a question of like, oops, um, why, um, why were we doing well, right? It's very important to be able to understand what's going on in these models. So what we did is we looked at the various topics. Again, this is going back to just a simpler problem of mortality prediction rather than the question of intervention need. And if we go back to the simpler question, um, there are certain topics. Again, if you're not familiar with topic models, think of them as just collections of words, like patterns and co-occurrences or, or themes. So there are certain themes in the clinic notes that are good in green, that improve your chance for survival. Um, and then there's other themes that are bad, right? So if that constellation of terms is occurring in your note, it's a bad sign, right? So that's, a, okay, not, nothing um, that you can really grok from this yet, but um, we can see that there's some things that seem to be important, right? Like, for example, this one over here. Like, if you got this one, this is really bad, right? <laughs> it's really decreasing your, chances of survival. So what is this one? Well, let's look at the top words associated with this particular topic. So this is topic 27. Um, so we have uh, top words are name, family, 
neuro care noted status plan. I'm not exactly sure what S title or S title is. Um, doctor and remains. So I, I see a couple people nodding. <laughs> like this kind of makes sense. <laughs> it does make sense. <laughs> Um, it is also not particularly useful, right? So what we call this, we call this causality leakage. So what this is suggesting is like these people already knew, right, that the situation was looking bad. These are a lot of terms that have to do with that looks like end of life decisions. So if they're already having end of life di discussions, us being able to be like, hey, we have a really awesome prediction for you <laughs> is not very helpful, right? So this is a reason why um, interpretability in these sorts of domains can be very important. Because what really happened here, and this happens all the time, right? Because the clinician suspects something, right? And it's in their head. And then they order some tests or they start making some decisions. And then the AI notices um, that, oh, there's a lot of activity going on, right? Whatever it is, of whatever kind. And then um, some event happens, right? Some really bad event happens, some good event happens. Um, but the AI was picking up on this point in time and not you know, before the clinician already knew. So this is a really, really big issue. Um, and, and it comes up in all sorts of situations because oftentimes patients are given treatments because there's something that's going wrong, right? Like if everything's going fine, we don't give them a, we don't give them a treatment. And we're seeing this right now. I, I'm teaching a course that uh, several of you all are in where we're applying reinforcement learning methods to sepsis management. And we're finding that, you know, the patients who are sick have more vasopressors, right? Kind of makes sense. Um, and so if you're an AI and you look at what's the mortality rate of people who did never, never got a vasopressor, and what's the mortality rate of people who did get one? Oh, it looks like when you give people a vasopressor, they die more often. So maybe we should just not do that, right? Um, so again, this is the sort of thing that comes over, over and over. It's a causality question. But the issue is that when we have data that is of low quality, it's observational, we're not going to go in and do some sort of causal study in this population, at least not without a lot of evidence that we're going to do something reasonable and, and not actually harm patients, then we have, to, we have to find some proxy, right? Like at least we can try to identify when such situations are happening. And I'll just mention a couple of really other sorts of things. So it, it, you know, maybe you're, you're thinking at this moment, oh, causality, right? Like, I mean, you're kind of making some fuss about it, but I know that you know, there, there are people, you know, go, go talk to Jamie Robbins. He can solve this for you um, or something like that, right? It, but there's things that go beyond that in terms of the sorts of things that go wrong in terms of the causality leakage. Um, so we, we've noticed in the depression case um, where we noticed that like, women seem to be prescribed Prozac more often. And we're like, oh, does Prozac work better in women than in men? No. It just turns out that ob uh, you know, for whatever reason in their training, are trained to prescribe Prozac over other drugs. Um, and so this is, again, just a side effect that means absolutely nothing. Um, in, in the autism data we worked with, there was this um, awesome fail where the word two sometime, somehow silently in the data turned to T0. And then suddenly 30% of our patients had cancer because T0 was interpreted as a cancer stage. Um, and so these are sorts of things that happen completely silently in our data. Um, we had absolutely no idea. Um, and also, uh, as various people in my lab in the course have noticed, um, units change. So here is a plot of how um, weight was changing over time for a particular patient. Um, Mike and I talked to our colleagues, and we said, we are not doctors. But is it possible <laughs> in, three, in, in an hour to go from 100 pounds to over? <laughs> That's a lot of water, right? We're 70% water, so all weight gain is typically water. Um, but, and they're like, no, you know, pounds to kilos and back again, uh, or kilos to pounds and back again. And this sort of stuff happens all the time, right? So what do we do about it, right? Like, can machine learning solve all this? Um, well, no. <laughs> these, these problems are hard, right? It's really, really hard to solve these problems. And so, the thing that I'm going to talk about for the rest of the talk 
is one of many options, which is explanation. And that's a bit that my lab is currently focusing on uh, a lot these days. Um, I started out working on healthcare problems because I, I feel like they're very societally important and more and more my lab has now become interested in interpretability or explanation because I feel like that's just an absolutely essential piece to actually making these things useful in practice. So first of all, like, is there any hope? Um, you know, there's been a ton of articles lately about like how like AI is just going to be too hard to understand, especially with the deep learning revolution. Like we just are never going to be able to understand what these AIs are doing. We should just give up, right? And, and, and we should, or, or that explanation or, or transparency comes at the expense of prediction, right? So the, the naysayers are always like, you know, are you going to accept more car accidents just because you want a system that can explain every accident? Right? Which I don't think is the case in healthcare because we actually have to prevent errors from machines as well as preventing errors from humans. Right? That ideally, you create a, a system that is able to use both the human, which has information that the machine doesn't have, and the machine, which has information that the human doesn't have, and put them together to get a decision that's better than either. Right? So that, that would be the goal. And the key point that I want to make here is like, yes, you know, there's too many nodes in these neural networks. Um, even in the topic models, uh, or like an SVM, it becomes it make it high dimensional enough. We don't we don't know right <laughs> exactly. We can't we can't describe the system of computations. We can't work it out by hand. Um, we cannot simulate what it means, right? But the key point is that explanation is not transparency, right? We are not hoping to understand how an SVM works. We're not hoping to follow like all the, the numbers going through all the ReLUs in our neural networks. We are trying to identify, like, does this decision make sense or not? And so one thing that can be useful, like a general sense of how an algorithm is working, can still provide insights into whether or not it's overall doing the right thing. Just like with the example that I showed you, with the mortality prediction in the ICU, you like I mean I didn't even I, I had that really complicated pipeline. It wasn't so complicated, but you know it, it had many pieces, right? Where there was like all this analysis going in, and it was being fed into this other thing, which is fed into this other thing, and then finally out came a mortality prediction. And all I had to do was just show you some of the top words in one of the topics, um, and you knew that there was something wonky going on, right? And so I did not. This was not a transparent system. You didn't know kind of how all those bits were being computed, um, but I gave you a piece of an explanation and that was sufficient for you to be able to identify whether it was sensible or not. So that's what I mean by often a very general sense of how an algorithm is working can often be very insightful. So to give an example of this, I'm going to just give um, one work that we're currently um, doing in our lab. And this is the notion of having a tree regularized model. So decision trees aren't always the best predictors. Um, we know that. Um, why else would we be using neural networks or all these other complicated things? Um, and they're not always the most interpretable either because once you start having a bunch of branches, um, there's a variety of cognitive science research that shows that if people aren't actually very good at following through really, like a, a deep decision tree essentially, like you can't understand, you can't really explain it back, right? But they're still kind of viewed as like a canonical example of an interpretable model. And especially if they're short, for sure, like you can interpret what they mean, right? There's a, just a bunch of if-then statements and branches that you have to follow through. So here's the question. Um, here we have our input. It goes into our really complicated black box, and out comes our prediction. And that prediction, um, we're, let's just say initially, we're not even going to touch it. Um, and so it can be as high quality as it wants to be. And then it go, we have another box here, completely independently, and it produces some other output that's probably worse in quality, right? Because it's, it's a simple model, it's something that's easy to explain. And then the next question that we ask is, well, if we want these two to be somehow similar to each other, right, so that this box over here is somehow being faithful to the overall decision-making process in this box, 
how do we go about doing it, right? So that might be, that might cost us a bit in terms of this black box. Maybe it has to be a little bit simpler. Um, and then we could pay the cost here by making this one more complex, right? So there's going to be a trade-off here between we could make this one simple so they match, or we could make this one not as simple. Uh, if we want it to be the case that these are like approximately the same, right? That's kind of the goal. So let's try to formalize this. So here is our black box right here. So F is this one over here that produces the Y hat. And so in general, we would have a loss of the form that here is our true value Yn. Here is our uh, predicted value. So we're just putting Xn, and this is the parameters of the function. So remember, y hat is just the output of this function over here. So we have some loss. This is the standard loss that you would use in you know, whatever problem, prediction loss, um, cross entropy, pick your favorite. So you have this over here. Um, and then we're going to penalize this. So this is where the regularization comes in. On the length of the decision tree um, that you have to follow down, like how, how deep do you have to go to actually make a decision? And the depth that you have to go, going back to here, if we want these to be reasonable, right? We don't want to have huge, huge prediction errors, then the size of the decision tree is going to depend on the parameters of the black box. So that's why I put a little w over here saying that given a parameter w, there's going to be some average path length. And how can we find this in practice? Well, we could take a bunch of these x's, put them in, get out a bunch of y hats, and we can just train a decision tree, right? That, that's our new training data because we want, again, y hat prime to match y hat. So this is what this looks like over here. Um, and this is an example of how we can regularize our model so that it, ha you know, overall has a kind of simple explainable form, but it's not being forced to look exactly like a decision tree. It's just saying that in general, like try to have a, it be similar to a short decision tree when you can, right? And you're allowed to not actually be exactly this. Because if you were exactly this, then we just have the decision tree. There'd be no point. So where, where does this get tricky? Well, um, so it encourages the short explanations, but this, this process here that I just described to you is a non-differentiable, complicated process. I mean, what we, it, you can do it in a couple lines of code. It's like collect all your x's, collect all your y's, call sklearn, learn a decision tree, um, <laughs> compute path lengths, right? You, you can write that in probably, I don't know, 15 lines of code or something like this. Three. <laughs> Pablo says three, that's your challenge. <laughs> but um, so it's easy to do, but you can't really differentiate through that, right? So the, the key innovation that we introduced here is that we approximate this path length. So we learn a separate black box function, a neural network, that's going to give us um, the path length based on some training data. So you imagine this algorithm is optimizing over time. It's collecting a bunch of different settings of the weight w. And for each setting of the weight w, now you can train a decision tree, compute those path lengths. And that gives you training data to be able to guess what would happen if you change the weights, which is kind of wacky, but it worked. So here, let me give you just a very simple just example of what it, this thing in action. So what you see over here is if you just apply like an L2 regularization, so instead of this complicated thing over here, something very, very simple, let's just penalize the squared norm of the weights. Um, over here, this is L1 regularization, so that's just the L1 norm of the weights, and this is a tree regularization. And the problem was the following. Can you separate the red dots from the yellow dots? And on purpose, we had created it so, such that there's some noise, right? They're not perfectly separable. It looks roughly like a parabola. So if you give your neural networks a ton, a ton of capacity, they're going to try to uh, make the separation perfect, right? Because you can just do it. So right now, we're just looking at training. So that's why if you don't have a lot of regularization, you have lots of really funny looking boundaries um, across the board. And going across this way, 
we're increasing the regularization. So, you know, initially you still have funnier and funnier boundaries. And toward the end here, it's starting to look more and more like a parabola, right? Um, so that's good. Um, and with the L1 regularization, you have a similar story where it starts looking, you know, less wacky as you go across this way because it's being penalized to have fewer weights, essentially. That when you put an L1 penalty on the weights, even if you gave this a really huge neural network, it's trying to turn pieces of that neural network off. Again, would you do this in real life? Maybe not. But this is just to illustrate a point. Like, what if you gave it a ton of capacity? What could it do? What might it want to do? Um, and here's a tree regularization. So it starts out similarly, you know. And then you notice, at some point, the regularization becomes high enough, you start getting boundaries that actually look like boxes, which makes sense from a decision tree perspective because it's saying, well, try to find something that can be is succinctly described by axis-specific decisions. And so the, the point of this is both just to illustrate the sort of boundaries that this is encouraging it to produce if it can, right? And notice if for low levels of regularization, it does not do that. Um, and also pointing out that this is different than the sorts of smooth, smooth boundaries that you get with the other regularization. So it's really you taking your pick, right? Like this, this might actually be the right thing um, in certain applications, but if you want to have like a simple set of decision rule that comes out um, that you want people to be able to stare at, then this is something that's much easier to explain. Again, in a, in a two-dimensional example, maybe not so much, um, but when you have all these high-dimensional data, more so. And we can also show. Oh, those are the errors that are being made um, because we purposefully made it not possible if, if you're doing a reasonable job of finding boundaries. And just again to, to hone in the point that these things are different, if you look at the size of decision tree associated with the boundary on this axis, so increasing size of decision tree on this axis um, and prediction quality on this axis, if we use our tree regularization, which is in yellow, for smaller trees, you are getting better accuracy. And if you use some other simpler form of regularization than the more complicated thing that I put up, well, you, do, you can get high accuracy, um, but it's going to come at larger node counts, right? So the, the parabola shape that these guys are maybe going to that provide good prediction accuracy is not providing you a succinct decision tree boundary, right? So in the plots that I'm going to show you now, again, the, the question is, like, can we, uh, on this node count metric, which is the one that, the game that we're trying to win, we want to show you smaller trees, um, can we do a better job? Can we get higher accuracy sooner? So if we look at real data, oh, sorry, one, one other thing that I wanted to point out before getting to real data um, is that it, this, this wacky idea that I mentioned that let's just collect a lot of these um, weights as we go from our neural network and use it to train a surrogate, like because we had that approximate path length, does it work? So here we show um, the true node count in, in yellow over various training iterations, um, and we show our predicted node count, so the surrogate that we're optimizing on, um, and it, it actually tracks fairly well. Um, and I, this, was a, this was a piece that we didn't know whether it would work when we, when we first started this um, and took a bit of cleverness because you need to kind of have your, your training data be close enough to the real data but also spread out enough that you can actually, when you train your surrogate, you can take derivatives against it and have it ho hope that it's actually going to decrease your node count. Um, but here's, the, here's the, the figure to show that it, it's behaving as expected. All right, so let's return now to the ICU case. Uh, we're trying to make a number of predictions, so we go back to mortality prediction. Um, and here in green is our approach, and what you see and we'll see in the next set of plots is that if you allow for large node counts, everyone can do well, right? If you allow for very expressive models, you can make great predictions, or you, know, you kind of reach a ceiling into the quality of predictions that you can make. And the question is, uh, if you are forced to have something that's simple enough for people to understand, um, using our approach, you can get a simpler, a, a, in terms of a trade-off, you can manage a trade-off better to have something that has a simple explanation, but also has reasonable prediction performance, 
And one thing I also want to note here at this juncture is that for most of the stuff that we're developing here, the idea is uh, uh, there's a lot of like quality checking that we're trying to do along the way. So I'm not necessarily advocating that we all, like once we, you know, we always use the interpretable model, but it's important to use the interpretable model first, or at least be able to interpret the model that we have first to weed out all the weirdnesses that might be in the data. And then once you kind of have something that you trust, that you think is based on reasonable data, then you can, you can take a step back and you can say, okay, now you know, I'm, I, I'm ready to trust the black box, right? Um, you know, take away anything that might be holding it back um, and just optimize away, right? Um, so it's one of those things that is a, it's a continuum. I think interpretability will always be needed. Um, and then almost always at some point on a specific problem, it's the need for it will go away. But then there'll be another problem where you need interpretability again. So, um, so with that, um, similar sorts of trends for 90-day mortality, um, mechanical ventilation prediction, vasopressor prediction, um, whether it's needed over half the time or whether it's needed at all in various time segments. In all these cases, um, the, you know, the trees match the black box 85 to 90 percent of the time, right? So they're not perfect. Again, if they were perfect, that would obviate the whole point of this. Um, but are, they are capturing a lot of the variation that you're seeing in the neural network. All right, so with that, um, I'd like to uh, show you an example, right? <laughs> you, can't, you can't claim interpretability without actually showing a picture of what it looks like. Um, so here is an example um, of a tree that we learned for predicting when mechanical ventilation is needed um, that closely matches our black box model of when ventilation might be needed. Um, and I, I'm not the intensivist, but we showed it to our colleague who is um, and who went, verified that, okay, these decisions make sense in terms of, um, you know, what, you know we, would you look at the GCS score um, and et cetera, et cetera. So these are the people who are going to need it more likely and, and the people who are not. Right. So these are the sorts of things that we get out um, that we can actually show to our clinical expert. Um, <clears throat> And before I conclude, I want to just also note that we applied the same idea to HIV treatment recommendations, something I'm not really going to talk about today in the interest of time, um, and also a random like phone recognition problem. You know, so this is generally applicable to a lot of different scenarios, even though I focused on the ICU. Cool. So I'm going to summarize now, um, and that way I can leave some time for questions. Um, so in summary, there's lots of really um, interesting, technically very, very interesting um, and impactful opportunities in healthcare and specifically in the ICU. Um, as I mentioned at the very beginning, there's just tons of data being generated there. Um, clinicians are very receptive to any sort of tool that might help them manage those data. Um, if you are interested in this sort of research, I want to point you to two really important resources. Um, the first one is the MIMIC data set, which is the data set on which we have done all of our research. It's publicly available with a very lightweight human subject certification um, process. Uh, and it's just, it's absolutely amazing that you can get all of this data, um, just put it on your laptop, right? There's no regulation about where it has to live, et cetera. Um, and the other uh, resource that I want to point you to is mukmed.org, which is where there's a, there's a machine learning uh, for healthcare conference um, that I and my colleagues run. Um, fully archival, we have a clinician and a computational person review every paper. Um, and it's really the place where a lot of this sort of work and a lot of this community comes together. So if you're interested in this community, um, you can find out who's doing work there, the sort of stuff that we're publishing, and also what our events are. And then the final point that I want to leave folks with um, is that interpretability is essential for a lot of domains. Because it helps us, it's the proxy for, we want something to be safe, we want something to be fair, we want something um, to be reliable, we want something to be causal. But oftentimes, those objectives are very hard to encapsulate. So I talked about the causality problem. Another example might be the safety problem. You know, I want my self-driving car to be safe. Well, what does that mean, right? Like, how do you write that down as a bunch of test cases? 
Um, you know, you, you might say that means stay on the road, but then if there's something on the road, like a kid, does that mean you swerve off the road, right? So there's a lot of those situations that are going to be hard to necessarily, initially at least, unit test. And I feel like interpretability is your proxy, right? Until you figure out how to fully formalize your problem, interpretability is what can help you identify what that formalization of the problem should look like. So I encourage people to think about it um, and think about it rigorously, right? Um, and it, we're also doing a lot of work in our lab to identify what is actually human understandable, what is human, human simulable. Um, you got to show people pictures and actually have them try to figure out what they are, because um, that's what interpretability is all about. Cool. And with that, thank you, and I'm glad to take any questions. Two questions. Mm -hmm. Great talk, by the way. Um, the first one has to do with a baseline. The studies that you presented, for example, the mo um, mortality, I didn't see a curve for what a physician would have guessed with ah. the same information that you would have, because that would suggest you know my algorithm is capable of discerning more or less. Uh, and I've, I've received feedback from physicians that they want to compare any baseline anything that you produce with baseline. That's, mm -hmm. that's one aspect. And the second one is how do you choose your projects? Because, for example, the mechanical ventilation project you mentioned implies a subjective decision. Uh, so your label set actually is being, uh, uh, is reflecting more the practices of the hospital more than the quality of care. So saying that somebody needs or is ready to be weaned mm -hmm. uh, is just saying what you're learning is that at this you, hospital, at this hospital, this these, is your practice. These doctors think that this is when it's this person is supposed to. I mean, in the mortality example, it's clear because the person dies or doesn't die, right? right? But when somebody's weaned, it was because somebody decided. Yeah. And so your algorithm basically just learns that, but doesn't suggest best practices. And so, how do you deal with that? So, uh, so for the first question about um, are there, like, do we have baselines of what clinicians would do or how well they would predict, um, if we could get those, that would be amazing. If you, if you already queried some folks, I would love to put that on the plots. Um, so right now, we are just working with the data from the MIMIC data set. And we have intensivists that we connect with to ask questions like, you know, do these things make sense? Um, but we don't have the, like, the hardcore annotation people being like, OK, I'm going to go through a zillion records and, and make my own predictions about them. And I agree it would be very interesting. And I would love to know like, kind of how that, do, how that ends up matching up. My guess is that the clinicians are quite good, at least from talking to the intensivists that I know, where they'll say, you know, a couple hours in the ICU, I have a good gut sense of how this patient is going to perform, or at least they think they have a good gut sense. Um, <laughs> So it'd be good to test. Um, this is again where I don't think mortality prediction is the most interesting right. question because you know even if their gut sense says that this is not going to look good, um, they still have to do something, and they have to figure out what the something is. Um, so remind me of your second question. Oh, 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 right, right. So uh, how do you how do you deal with practice, right? And so there's there's a limit to how much you can deviate from practice variation. So in our case, in terms of recommending, so when the when the patient goes on, right, that part is very much linked to the hospitals policy. So we cannot really, what we are predicting is exactly like, okay, if you're continued with the way that business operations at the hospital work, I can tell you when you might be needing certain things, right? Which may be still useful because it tells you from an operations perspective, if this is kind of like your established policy, then if you, then this is the, you know, we're, we're providing you some forecasting on your, on your, on your set of whatever goals. For the weaning, I would say that we are getting a little closer to ideal in the sense that suppose that you have a notion as a hospital of when a patient is ready to wean. So there's a way that they look right before they're weaned. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to see like how early did they start looking like that. So that is something that can be actually used to change policy or think about changing policy. So, so just one, one comment, and yeah. I'm happy to speak offline. Yeah. Uh, we've we've estimate, we evaluated the readiness test, winning mm -hmm. readiness test, and their uh, predictability is very close to the identity in the AUC curves. So it's like none, it's coin flipping. So if, uh, so just, just to warn, 
that the fact that you are uh, predicting uh, something like that may not mean that the patient was actually ready. Right. It just means that they actually enacted the decision. But anyways, yeah, happy to yeah, for sure. Say. Yeah, yeah, definitely. We can we can discuss in more detail. I mean, we we did exclude cases where they had to be like, for example, uh, put back on the vasopressor or reintubated or something. So the subset question is a good one. That one we haven't tried. If we just rerun multiple times, um, which already introduces randomness because of random restarts and stuff, the trees are fairly stable. The main pieces of the often, like I think about seventy percent of the time, um, the trees were exactly the same, and the rest of the time. Um, Portions of the tree, like sub, major subtrees were the same and there were some differences, but that's a really important question about, you, you want the interpretation to actually make sense. And then another piece of work that we do in my lab is try to find multiple interpretations for the same data in order to be honest about the fact that maybe there might have been multiple ways of coming to the conclusion that we came to. Yeah. Um, so for a lot of like So I think those are all great questions, and I think it's a, it is still an open question, especially it, it's not even that you have few examples, um, because there's bandit versions of RL problems where the game only lasts one round or something like this. Um, but there's, or, or many, many one-off problems. Um, but there are situations where those, those time differences are just so different, and they're informative, right? If someone's doing well, maybe they don't come back. Um, and so that's something we definitely struggle with with our psych data. Um, with our HIV data, that's the closest one that we've come to applying RL. Um, and there, at least, we have the benefit of their, it's a registry, so they come in every six months. So at least we get to check in on them. Uh, but it's one of these things about, um, like, in terms of how we choose our problems, there's a lot of vetting that goes into, you know, is there something that we think that there's something that can be done or not? Hey, uh, I also have two questions. Um, first one is, uh, other than the clinical treatment, do you see any other healthcare area where that reinforcement learning can be applied? Uh, a second question is about reinforcement learning itself. I'm, I'm not an expert. I just you know, start as a good, stupid question. So you collect some data, and then you understand the model, and then you try to build a model, and then uh, let the you know AI to study, right? So, so how do you let the the agent to study? Because reinforcement learning, my understanding is you you don't feed the data, you just build a model and let it learn, right? So how how exactly that works? Yeah, so um, so the first question in terms of like what other problems besides, so treatment assignment makes sense because it's a sequential decision making problem. So it's very much fits into this paradigm. Uh, but any other, like it could be at multiple levels. So it could be treatment for a patient. Um, you could also be thinking about policy. If you're thinking about a set of policies that you want to roll out, um, so now you're thinking about how populations might respond rather than how specific patients might respond. And the core piece is that are there a set of decisions that need to be made over time? So any, any scenario that's set up as a set of decisions uh, that you have to make over time um, can be put into a reinforcement learning framework. And then what you point out in, the, in your second question, it, so it's absolutely the case that standard RL, like classical RL, is more like the Atari setup, right? Like you have something to play and you just play the game over and over until you can win. Um, obviously you can't do that with patients. So there's a whole separate branch within reinforcement learning called off policy or batch reinforcement learning. But how can you learn um, not by playing the game, but by having seen the game being played by a bunch of people, in this case the clinicians? Yeah. In when you talked about the causality leakage, where the AI picked up that a test was uh, prescribed by the doctor. So you're trying to predict actions by the, by, by the doctor. But in your clinical notes, you seem to be picking up tests or actions that are written down in the notes. Right. So how exactly do you distinguish between 
what you're trying to predict the actions from actions that are being captured in your clinical notes. Yeah, absolutely. So this is, the, this is the part that's actually very, very hard, right? That if you're trying to alert people in advance, you don't actually know how far in advance they knew something. Because like by the time it gets into the note, they probably already knew it, right? That's why they're writing it down. Um, so if you want an alert system, it has to kind of be far enough in advance that it's not just like, oh, I saw the word in the note. Um, and I think that's not an easy problem to solve. Um, and that's where the interpretability comes in. I think in specific cases, you can come up with specific solutions. So you can say that, it, like, it, you know, I, I generally, you know, these things have this sort of time scale. So I've seen something in the note, then if, unless I can make my prediction at least four hours or six hours in advance of any indication that I see, um, you know, I think that's, then it's a legit um, prediction. But if I'm making a prediction afterwards, then maybe it doesn't make sense. Or I might say that there are certain, certain features that I just should not be using in my classification system. But I think as soon as it becomes, as soon as you make it into a specific problem, it, it does become very domain and problem specific on how do you prevent the sort of causality leakage from happening. And that's why, um, again, we, we focus on interpretability as a proxy to at least identify that something is wonky and then you can have a discussion with the domain experts, the, the clinicians, or whoever it is, to figure out, okay, for this situation, here's the sort of leakage we're seeing. What's the best way to deal with that, um, that problem? Can I ask the last? Sure, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> of course. So those values are the regularization parameter is set up in Validation. So here, um, these are, so this is validation AUC, so not, not training, but um, on test. And how do we set the lambda? So this is over a range of lambda. So each dot here represents a different choice of lambda, and each choice of lambda gives you a different trade-off. So if you choose that, if you say that I want, you, like basically lambda equals infinity, um, it says make it gives you nothing, right? It says AUC of 0.5 because it says that you need a zero level decision tree. Um, just predict a chance. And then as you um, decrease lambda, so this can be viewed as decreasing lambda or decreasing regularization along the x-axis. And, so, and the validation is of the original data, not, not between y hat and y hat. That's right. It's on the original data um, and a separate test set, et cetera, et cetera, doing it properly. All right. Thank Thanks, everyone.